Hello, so today we're going to talk about the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is not in your Bible. It's not in the New Testament. It's one of really dozens of early accounts of the life and sayings of Jesus and his disciples that got cut when they put the Bible together. It's such a fascinating story. We were thinking about it a little bit the other day. The, the various councils that the Roman the early Roman church convened like at Carthage in 1419, where in many ways we can say that the our current, you know, finalized Bible was finalized. The final selections were made. That had been a process that had been going on for centuries, but it was completed in 419. And all of the different gospels that got left out were lost to us, many of them. We 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 have a few of them we've discovered a few of them uh but a lot of them we just know by title they're just gone because the church then in its in its best intentions i suppose to characterize this as charitably as possible um eliminated as 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 much untruth as it could <laughs> It wanted to preserve the world for what it understood as the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and in its mind, then, that meant eliminating all of the heresy or, uh, I suppose today we might put it this way, all of the dissenting views on the nature of Jesus, the mission of Jesus, the purpose of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. So it is fascinating to look back at this particular gospel, the Gospel of Thomas, to re-examine some of those questions. And it takes us back to one of the first questions we asked when we began our Christian studies, namely, who was Jesus? And the difficulty in answering that question to everyone's satisfaction. So kind of depends on where you look, right? Certainly the gospels in the Bible present a portrait, uh, an answer to that question, who was Jesus? But as we just mentioned, there were a lot of different answers to that question right away. I mean, in the first, second, and third century, there was a lot of diversity of thought. I suppose you could say that the ascension of the Christian church was in some ways the restriction of that diversity into a kind of official company line. And that official position, that official position is the is the one you find in your New Testament, you know, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and in many ways, especially John, with its full-throated affirmation of the divinity of Christ. Let's see what happens when we look at this, the Gospel of Thomas. So, the Gospel of Thomas was discovered in 1945. I mean, we knew that it existed before then, because we, we'd heard its name, and in fact, all the way back in 1897, in a tomb somewhere in the Mediterranean, they found fragments in Greek, fragments of something called the Gospel of Thomas. But in 1945, somebody found the whole thing, but it was in Coptic, in, in Egyptian tongue. Um, and so we think that that Gospel of Thomas that someone found in Egypt in 1945, we think that it was a Coptic translation of an earlier Greek text. That's what the that's what the linguistic evidence indicates. But in any event, suddenly, like a message in a bottle, out pops the Gospel of Thomas, the whole thing. It's almost as if here we have a telegram from the first century that escaped those 2,000 years of Christian orthodoxy of the restriction of the variety of texts and positions and ideas. So here comes this with this radical, heretical text from the first century popping up into somebody's hands in 1945, roughly around the time of the Dead Sea Scrolls. A lot of exciting stuff was happening in Jewish and Christian and in biblical scholarship in the mid 20th century. But I don't think there's anything more electrifying than the Gospel of Thomas, and let's see why. It is unlike the canonized Gospels in a number of key ways. The first thing you notice when you open it up is that it has no narrative, no story at all. It's just a collection of sayings, the sayings of Jesus, in no particular order, with no narrative threads. 
So in that way, it resembles the Analects of Confucius or the Tao Te Ching of the Taoist tradition, the sayings of Lao Tzu. Um, it's just a wisdom book with no beginning, middle, or end. And, and what happens when you take all of the story out is you just have this, this collection of wisdom sayings. In, in other words, there's no virgin birth. There are no miracles. There is no walking on water. There are no magical healings. There's no crucifixion. There's no death. And there's no resurrection. And when you strip all of that out of the Gospels, well, there goes the foundation of traditional mainstream Christian orthodoxy, that Jesus died for your sins, that he is a divine being, etc. Instead, we just have notes from Jesus's lectures. It's sort of how it reads and sort of how it feels. In other words, the Jesus presented to us by the Gospel of Thomas is remarkably different than the Jesus presented to us by the Gospels in the Bible. In Thomas, Jesus did not die for your sins. He is not the Redeemer. His death does not lift us out of original sin. What you get instead is a wisdom teacher whose sayings offer gnosis or knowledge. And that Greek word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, is at the heart of the project of the Gospel of Thomas. So the message of the Gospel of Thomas, I suppose, and we'll see for ourselves, I'm going to get into some passages here in a moment, is that salvation, or if you will, transformation, comes not from his actions, from Jesus's actions, but it comes from our actions, our willingness to enter into deepening awareness or gnosis. So here's the opening lines. Here's how the book opens. These are the hidden sayings that the living Jesus spoke and Judas Thomas the twin recorded. And he said, whoever discovers the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. So there's the thesis of the text. When you discover the, the interpretation of these sayings, when you figure out what these wisdom sayings are about, you will not taste death. That's a frequent way in this period of describing getting from the surface of things to the depth of things, moving from the world of form to formlessness, from opinion to knowledge, from becoming to being, getting down to what's real. It happens in the Gospel of Thomas through gnosis. It goes on in verse 108, I'm gonna to jump to 108. Jesus said, whoever drinks from my mouth will become like me. I myself shall become that person and the hidden things will be revealed to that person. Whoever drinks from my mouth. A poetic way, I suppose, of saying, whoever understands what I am saying, again. And when you understand what Jesus is saying, the text claims, you become like him and he will become like you. I myself shall become that person. In other words, the multi the, the multiplicity or the duality of the world is unified through gnosis. When you, let me switch into the Buddhist terms here. When you awaken, you enter into the embodied realization of oneness, of dharmakaya, of Buddha consciousness, of Jesus consciousness. This won't be the first time we'll notice this, but there are some really strong both Buddhist and Vedanta or Hindu threads that run through this text. I'm not saying this is a Hindu or Buddhist book. What we're confronting is the idea, well, Aldous Huxley put it this way, right? The perennial philosophy that mystics all over the world sort of talk the same. The theologians disagree, Meister Eckhart said, but the mystics of the world all agree. And this is another example of that. And what about the kingdom of heaven? We've touched on that idea a few times here. Let's see what Gospel of Tom, what the Gospel of Thomas does with that idea. Here's what Jesus says in verse 3. 
If your leaders say to you, look, the kingdom is in heaven, then the birds of heaven will precede you. If they say to you, it is in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, the kingdom is inside you and it is outside you, Jesus said. So there, Jesus seems to be pushing back against the idea that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is a place or a future event. He's, he's a pretty, pretty funny little line, you know, that if the kingdom is up there, then the birds are going to beat you there. And if the kingdom is in the sea, then the fish are going to beat you there. So he's gently mocking the idea, the notion that the kingdom of heaven is a physical space. Instead, he says, it is within you and it is, it is without you. It is inside you and it is outside you. Hmm. And then he goes on to say this. When you know yourselves, then you will be known. And you will understand that you are children of the living Father. But if you do not know yourselves, then you dwell in poverty and you are poverty. That's gnosis. Gnosis as self-knowledge, when you know yourselves. Reminds me of the Socratic idea, the Greek idea, know thyself, that the unexamined life is not worth living. And it also, again, reminds me of the Atman idea in Vedanta or the awakening idea in Buddhism, that, that the human condition is such that we get caught by the shiny baubles around us. We get stuck with superficialities, with surfaces, with opinions, with prejudices, with conditioning. All of these spiritual teachers are calling us to pull back a little bit from our snap judgments about the stereotypes around us. Sit still, be quiet, and go within and realize, maybe not even intellectually know, but realize or make real our oneness. The kingdom of heaven with, is within us. And then he says in verse 67, Jesus says, one who knows all but is lacking in oneself is utterly lacking. And in verse 70, Jesus said, If you bring forth what is within you, what you have will save you. If you do not have that within you, what you do not have within you will kill you. Jesus talks tough in these passages, and that's a good example. So there's the phrase save, even like salvation. If you do not bring forth your deep inner self, your Atman, your Dharmakaya, if you do not bring forth what is within you, you will die. But if you bring forth what is within you, what you have will save you. See, this is what makes the Gospel of Thomas seditious and heretical. Salvation comes from within. What do I need priests for? What do I need the church for? What do I need the Bible for? That's, that's hostile to the traditional mainstream Christian project, which is built upon fealty to the church, devotion to Jesus, and loyalty to the scripture. This is a dangerous spiritual teacher, this Jesus guy. Then we go on to this other idea about how the teachings are kind of hidden. You know, they're, they're esoteric, to put it in simple uh, terms. That, that is to say, hidden or um, not obvious. And the only way to gain esoteric wisdom is to kind of work on it for a while and get inside the wisdom. So in 13, this is a, one of the most remarkable stories, really, in the uh, whole Gospel of Thomas. Uh, it's verse 13. There's this whole scene. It's the longest scene in the Gospel. So Jesus said to his followers, compare me to something and tell me what I am like. So I think of this as test day for the disciples. The teacher comes to the students and says, here's my test question today for you guys. Oral exam, compare me to something and tell me what I am like. So Simon Peter said to him, you are like a just messenger. And Matthew said to him, you are like a wise philosopher. Thomas said to him, Teacher, my mouth is utterly unable to say what you are like. Jesus said, I am not your teacher. Because you have drunk, you have become intoxicated from the bubbling spring that I have tended. 
And Jesus took Thomas and withdrew. He pulls Thomas aside for a one-on-one. -on -one. Jesus took Thomas and withdrew and spoke three sayings to him. And when Thomas came back to his friends, they asked him, what did Jesus say to you? And Thomas said to them, if I tell you one of the sayings he spoke to me, you will pick up rocks and stone me and fire will come from the rocks and consume you. This is one of the most bracing stories of esoteric knowledge I have ever encountered in any wisdom texts. Jesus the teacher saying out loud, I am not your teacher. Jesus struggling to convey that which is ineffable to even his innermost circle. And I guess some of the students don't get it. You're a wise messenger, you're a philosopher, you know. And Thomas is like, you know what, you're ineffable. I can't say what you are. And apparently Thomas passed the test because Jesus pulls Thomas aside and gives him even three deeper, more hidden sayings. And then when Thomas comes back to the crew, they're like, what did Jesus say? And he's I can't tell you. If I told you, you'd kill me. What an amazing passage about the inability for even a master teacher to convey the lived experience of oneness. This stuff cannot be taught. It must be realized in the presence of a teacher. But to reduce it to formulas, to dogmas, to doctrines, this Jesus isn't having it. Now, just a little bit more about this kingdom of heaven. And, and sometimes in religious studies, we call it realized eschatology. Realized eschatology refers to the end times being present right now. Eschatology has to do with what's going to happen at the end of time. And so realized eschatology is the idea that we sometimes find, like right here, that, that it is here and now in the eternal present that we must access the kingdom of heaven, not in some future place. So in verse 24, the Gospel of Thomas says, His followers said, Show us the place where you are, for we must seek it. And Jesus said to them, whoever has ears should hear. There is a light within a person of light, and it shines on the whole world. If it does not shine, it is dark. And in verse 51, his followers said to him, when will the rest for the dead take place? And when will the new world come? And Jesus said to them, what you look for has come, but you do not know it. And in verse 113, his followers said to him, when will the kingdom come? And Jesus said, it will not come by watching for it. It will not be said, look, here it is, or look, there it is. Rather, the, the Father's kingdom is spread out upon the earth and people do not see it. That's Buddhism. That's Hinduism. That if you don't get it here, you're not going to get it anywhere. Eternity is not a lot of time. Eternity has nothing to do with time, Joseph Campbell puts it. Eternity is this, is this presence that, that is atemporal, has nothing to do with time. It's not a lot of time. Eternity is a atemporal moment, a timeless moment, where past, present, and future are all simultaneously occurring. You, you can't understand it in normal human consciousness. It is only to be accessed in this present moment. And much like in the Bhagavad Gita, in the great Hindu classic, the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna identifies himself with everything, look at what Jesus does. It's a similar kind of pantheism, you know, the idea that all is God. Jesus says in verse 77, I am the light that is over all things. I am all. From me, all has come forth, and to me, all has reached. 
Split a piece of wood, I am there. Lift up the stone, and you will find me there. Like in the Gita, Jesus, in that remarkable passage, identifies himself with all matter, all energy, all consciousness. This is the Dharmakaya idea of Buddhism, that Jesus stands before us in the teachings of the Gospel of Thomas, not as a unique being who is here to die on the cross and save us from our sinful nature. Jesus represents in this teaching what embodied awakened consciousness is. And he calls us to realize our own identity with that same awakened consciousness. So in the end, the Gospel of Thomas presents a radical portrait of, of a Jesus that does not sit well alongside the Jesus of the Synoptic Gospels, and especially John for that matter. Because in the theology of the Gospel of Thomas, we do not need salvation. We need knowledge, we need awareness, we need awakened consciousness. But the good news is it's what we already are. We just have to realize it. We just have to get past the surface of things and down to the depth. And as I said before, what makes this text and this teaching so dangerous is that if I don't need salvation, then I guess I don't need priests. And if I don't need priests, then I don't need a church. And now we can see why the theology of the Gospel of Thomas got it kicked to the curb. Because it was such a threat. You can, you can feel it yourself, right? It's such a threat to ecclesiastical authority. And so now we know why the Gospel of Thomas is not in your Bible. And yet it's so fortunate that through some accident, it popped out of a pack of scrolls at the bottom of a cliff um, found in an urn of ancient texts by a caravan trader, a camel riding caravan trader who brought it into town. It found its way to a some, anti some antiquities dealers and then into some scholars' hands, and now we have it. You know, who's really important on this topic of the Gospel of Thomas, and I want to give her credit, is Elaine Pagels. Elaine Pagels is a, um, is a remarkable voice in, in religious studies scholarship. And she's done great work around these questions, uh, most notably her book, the, the Gnostic Gospels. And she makes this point, I think she's right. She, she contrasts the Gospel of John and the Gospel of Thomas. And in many ways, they are opposites. Because the Gospel of John, as you recall from our earlier work, portrays Jesus in no uncertain terms as a fully divine being, as identical with God. Jesus is God and you're not. And it's blasphemy, isn't it? In most normal Christian and Jewish and Islamic circles to say, I am God. God is God and, and you are you. And it is blasphemy to identify oneself with God. But that's precisely what the Jesus of the Thomas Gospel asks us to do. He affirms again and again our oneness with the divine. And so the challenge, I think, is to take all of this in and to reflect on the dozens and dozens of Gospels that did not make it into our hands and all of the mixed messages that were swirling around in the first, second, and third century about Jesus and how, and, and how that all got hammered down into an orthodoxy, which kind of literally means like the narrow path, right? And as you and I are drawn to the sayings and the teachings of these great wisdom teachers, Jesus and Buddha and Krishna and Lao Tzu and Confucius and everybody, we have to ask good, good questions. We have to ask good questions about who are the caretakers of the sayings of the scriptures. What did they understand? What led them to leave certain texts in and other texts out? And do we have to blindly follow their lead? Or can we critically and philosophically examine for ourselves these bracing sayings, even though you can feel the danger, can't you? You can feel the risk. Look, I'll just be blunt. There are a lot of mainstream 
Christians today, evangelical Christians, Roman Catholics, name whatever denomination you want, who reject the Gospel of Thomas, who just say that, well, it's a, it's a false text. Okay, one could take that position, and many do. But one could also take the position that the Gospel of Thomas is just as legitimate as any of the other Gospels. It is only an article of faith that allows you to put the four Gospels of the Bible above texts like the Gospel of Thomas. If your faith teaches you that, that's, that's, that's one position one could take. But one could also incorporate all of these together into an increasingly rich, multifaceted portrait of what this remarkable teacher, Jesus, may have been.